In 2004, I finished a two-year associate fellowship uh, with the program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, Andrew Wiles program, and I learned a lot more about botanicals. And now I understand that when you extract the active component from a plant, you really take it out of the balance that nature gave it, and you remove it from the yin and yang, and you remove it from the supporting stroma of other compounds in the plant that may balance the, the effects of one single agent that's removed. So it doesn't bother me that marijuana as a medicine has many, many active components. Uh, again, we know that the, the most psychoactive is delta-9 THC, but clinical studies from Raphael Machulam's group in Israel have demonstrated that delta-8 THC, which is not present in uh, dronabinol, is just as effective in treating nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. In addition to the cannabinoids that come from the plant, we also make our own cannabinoids, just as we make our own uh, opioids, our uh, endorphins, uh, we form these endocannabinoids, our body's own cannabinoids, on demand as we need them. Uh, and they participate in a wide range of biological processes, and they are subsequently degraded uh, when they're no longer needed. Now this is a, a schema which shows uh, the synthesis of endocannabinoids here and how they act on the CB1 receptor and I just want you to look at the various activities that they're felt to be involved with. Control of appetite, immune function, muscle, pain, intraocular pressure in the eye, uh, cognition, uh, emesis, which is vomiting, neuroexcitability, reward, and thermoregulation. The CB2 receptor, the other receptor that's been well characterized, is more uh, involved in immune function, but you can see here it also acts uh, to modulate inflammation and pain. So in this discussion this morning about the use of cannabis in pain and palliative care, palliative care of course meaning care for patients at the end of life, you can see that the endocannabinoids and the CB1 and CB2 receptor provide us with a huge amount of potential and possibility uh, to influence patients uh, dealing with end-of-life situations. Most of my career before medical marijuana was involved with HIV research, but in fact, when I finished my residency, I became an oncology fellow uh, to become an oncologist or a cancer specialist, and now uh, cancer has really drawn me back, and I'm spending most of my time in research doing uh, oncology. And in cancer, if you just look at these list of symptoms, this is a drug company slide, but it shows you symptom management challenges associated with cancer, and it couldn't have been a better slide for you know, showing the benefits of cannabis. Whoops, let me go back. So the symptoms uh, that are listed are weight loss, uh, cachexia, which is, uh, as we know, weight loss, early satiety, which means getting full quickly, uh, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, moderate to severe pain, anxiety or depression, and acute nausea and vomiting. So most Western physicians would say, gee, we need seven different medicines for this, but guess what? There is one medicine that takes care of all of these different <laughs> symptoms. But we live in this evidence-based society where everybody wants evidence to, before anybody will act to do anything differently. The evidence uh, with regards to dronabinol, delta-9 THC in sesame oil, marketed as Marinol, uh, was good enough in 1986 to have that drug approved for the treatment of nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Now, 1986 was before we had our more potent uh, anti-nausea drugs available uh, that we have today. In 1992, on rather slim evidence, uh, the indication for prescribing Marinol was increased, and I think it's important to read the words, for the treatment of anorexia, or loss of appetite, associated with weight loss in patients with AIDS. It's not for the treatment of weight loss, because in the placebo-controlled trials that were conducted, dronabinol did not lead to increased weight compared to placebo dronabinol, it led to increased appetite. So whether or not there is a benefit of having an increased appetite if you don't gain weight is something that is unclear, but this was in 1992, and if you recall from the history lessons that we got yesterday, I think, uh, 1992 was the year that there was a potential flood 
uh, about to be unleashed on the compassionate use program. So the government shut that down, and then to say that there is something that we can give patients, they said here, we'll expand the indication for Marinol, even though the evidence was really not that strong. Well, when we started giving uh, our patients with HIV-related wasting uh, Marinol prescriptions, they'd all come back and say, you know, it's okay, but it's a little bit difficult to regulate, and it makes me awfully zonked. And if we look at the pharmacokinetics of THC taken by mouth, our patients were right. In general, the bioavailability or how much gets into the bloodstream is low, 6 to 20 percent, and variable. The peak concentration of THC that occurs in the plasma following an oral dose occurs at about two and a half hours after it's taken. So if you're trying to take this to increase your appetite for breakfast, you sort of have to get up pretty early if you want to have an increased appetite. Also, when taken by mouth, THC, whether it's dronabinol or whether it's baked in brownies, is degraded uh, by the liver into a bioactive metabolite, an 11-hydroxy-THC, uh, which isn't formed as much when it's smoked. And that's why people, when they take Marinol or uh, eat brownies, tend to be more sedated uh, than stimulated, if you will, because of the increased production of this uh, secondary metabolite. So that's why many of our patients in the early 90s were frequenting Dennis Perone's huge cannabis buyers club in San Francisco, and, and many of those that sprung up uh, when Dennis's was closed uh, to obtain actual marijuana instead of Marinol. <clears throat> and again, what we know is from the kinetics of smoke THC that the peak uh, absorption occurs at two and a half minutes after smoking with then a rapid decline. So the curve looks much more like this compared to what you get when you take it orally where you have a much lower peak that lasts for a much longer time. And smaller amounts of the 11-hydroxy byproduct are found, so not only can patients titrate uh, the effect better, uh, but there is a cleaner uh, effect as well. Now this is a slide I made just from listening to Dr. Piamelli's presentation yesterday, sort of condensing a lot of his talk uh, into uh, one slide. Uh, again, with regards to cannabinoids and pain throughout history, the association with cannabis and pain relief has been there. Uh, it's known that the brain regulates pain and also processes the pain experience that occurs elsewhere in the body, i.e. the pain is not occurring in the brain. The endocannabinoids that, that we have are there to centrally regulate our interpretation of the pain phenomenon. And they also work directly in the periphery via the CB2 receptor, via their anti-inflammatory activity uh, to curb the pain sensation. And again, somebody else yesterday was mentioning the effect that endocannabinoids have on memory. I think the best description in lay language of what endocannabinoids do is in Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire. I don't know if people have read that, but it's a wonderful book, and he really describes very clearly that endocannabinoids are there to help you forget. So while I'm standing here talking to you, I, I'm not thinking about the ocean and that, that she went on an eclipse and I didn't, that I know this person in the back there, you know, so I'm sort of focused. And so when you displace your endocannabinoids with plant cannabinoids, suddenly you, you lose that ability to forget and everything becomes, wow, you know, new. Anyway, so, so, I, so why do we have these endocannabinoids? It's probably to help us forget pain once we've uh, processed it. That maybe is how the whole systems are linked together. Now, there are elevated levels of this receptor, the cannabinoid 1 receptor, uh, in the brain in areas that are modulate noxious stimuli processing, similar to where the opioid receptors are located as well. The drugs that, that fit into the CB1 and the CB2 receptors seem to have peripheral analgesic or pain relieving action. And cannabinoids, as I've mentioned already a few times, have anti-inflammatory effects. So, you know, if you take a Motrin or one of those Naproxen, Aleve type drugs, that's working in relieving pain by decreasing inflammation. So cannabis has a twofer. You're having an anti-inflammatory effect as well as the central and peripheral analgesic activities. The uh, analgesic effects of cannabinoids are not blocked by drugs that block opioids, suggesting that they're working by two different mechanisms. 